Thank you. Okay. We are ready to get started again. Welcome back. Um, so most classes, most classes before we get started, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, there were a few things that I neglected to mention at the end of the first class relating to um, kind of syllabus relevant things. Uh, the first of these is I didn't really describe um, the uh, extra credit. And also, is the volume too loud, too low, or good? I can't really tell from up here. You want it louder? Okay. Okay, is that better? Louder still? I should just put the microphone in my mouth. How about now? Better? Okay. Okay. Um, so, the way extra credit works in here is uh, pretty much the same as it does in intro psych or a lot of the other sort of lower level classes where um, you can sign up to do uh, experiments. What's the new system called now? It used to be Experimetrics, but it's SONA, right? They changed the system, um, but basically the idea is the same. You sign up for experiments. I think when you do that, you designate what class you are getting the credit for. If you're taking this class and cognitive psychology, you can't use the same uh, study you do as extra credit for both. It's, it'll be one or the other. So I believe you designate. And uh, each hour of extra credit you do will add uh, a half a point to your final 100 point total. Now the critical thing here is, is that in the past, I used to always add in those extra credit points before figuring out what the average of the top 10 scores was. And I used to actually then, back then I used to do, you got a full point for each extra credit that you did. But people rightfully pointed out that if you're doing it that way, as long as the top 10 people all do the extra credit, it then basically just becomes a punishment for anyone who doesn't do the extra credit. Um, so to try to balance this out, I've now decided to make it where I will actually add the points after everything else has been settled in terms of what the curve is, but to make it reasonable, it's now a half a point per experiment instead of a point. And overall, I think it works out to having about the same total impact on your grade. So you can get up to a point and a half added. Um, which means, you know, uh, a 91 becomes a 92.5, and a 92.5 is an A rather than an A minus. So that certainly could have a substantial impact for a number of you. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, briefly mention ahead of time is that I know that there's always people in here who uh, are not in the section that they would like to be in, or occasionally even the section they can be in. Uh, so a couple things about section. You do have to go to your officially enrolled section. Attendance will be taken every week. Um, that section occurs. And if you're not in your section, you will be marked down as absent and get no credit for that section. So there's a couple things we do to try to facilitate folks being able to switch sections if they need to. First, and I'll try to remember this at the end, but I'll, I'll tell you now, at the end of today, at the end of lecture today, if you're someone who wants to, is willing to, or needs to change sections, come up to the front of the room at the end of class today. And then hopefully people can sort of talk briefly and figure out if there's any matches where people can switch. I've also set up on the Blackboard website a discussion board for people who are uh, willing, wanting, or needing to change sections. So post your request there, put it in the subject line of what you write. You know, can anyone switch to this time? Will anyone switch with me so I can get into that time? And that ends up working out for some of the people. When you find someone to switch with you, you have to go over to Psychology Undergraduate Advising together, and they can do the switch for you in the computer. It's not enough for the two of you just to say, we'll switch. It has to be officially changed. Otherwise, it's not going to show up on the TA's spreadsheet. 
Now the one other option that occasionally and in limited ways gets used is if you really need to switch sections, you can discuss with your TA the possibility of moving from one of their sections to another of their sections. The reason why um, I'm a bit more okay letting this one happen unofficially is that it's the same TA grading you in both cases, but okay, I leave it entirely up to the TA's discretion as to whether to allow this. Uh, and they probably aren't going to allow this too often because if they did, what you would have is whoever it is that signed up for Friday morning sections would all say, we'll go to our TA's Wednesday afternoon sections. Okay? And there isn't room for 50 people in one section and for the other section to have two people. So um, this is something that gets used very sparingly, but if you really can't work it out to switch with someone else, you can talk to your TA and, and see if that's something um, that they would accommodate. Okay, so any other questions about course mechanics or anything before we get back to the good stuff? Hopefully. The syllabus is posted on the Blackboard website. The no, the date was the first day of the week. So it was just indicating which week it was. But it says at the top of the columns Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So uh, today we're going to be talking about situational construal and naive realism. Uh, both are terms that social psychologists have made up over the last 30 years. Most of what social psychologists talk about are the things that everybody else already talks about in the real world, but sometimes we have to make up new words to talk about those things in a sensible way. Um, I think that these two concepts are two of the most important concepts in social psychology, which is why there's a whole lecture devoted to them. And they go a long way towards explaining hypotheses one through three of the five hypotheses that uh, we went through during the first lecture. So we're going to go through this, and I want to start, um, uh, a lot of what I'm going to do today is try to demonstrate this concept for you. And so I'm going to start with um, a study that was done using the prisoner's dilemma game. Can I get a show of hands of how many people are familiar with the prisoner's dilemma? Right, about half, okay. So the idea behind the prisoner's dilemma is that there's two people uh, whose outcomes are kind of jointly determined. So each of these two people can decide whether to cooperate with the other person or to essentially defect and not cooperate with the other person. And there are financial outcomes depending not just on what you decide to do, but what you decide to do in conjunction with what the other person decides to do. And usually you don't get to discuss it with the other person first. So usually you just have to decide for yourself what you're going to do, trying to figure out what the other person would want to do and kind of what you want the outcome to be. So this is what um, the prisoner's dilemma uh, matrix typically looks like. Um, and so let me just explain this. So there's, imagine you're player A, and you're playing with someone else, player B, and you're never going to meet that person. And you have to decide, are you going to cooperate or defect, which just means not cooperate. The other person has to make the same decision. And in each case, you get the amount of money that's in the bottom right corner, because you're player A, so player A is the bottom right corner of each of these. You get that amount of money, as a function of where the other person kind of places you in the matrix. So let me explain, because I know this is a bit abstract. If you decide to cooperate and they decide to cooperate, this is your cell. You've both cooperated, so you're right here. The player B gets $3, you get $3. Okay. If um, the uh, other person decides to defect and you cooperate, they get $4 and you get $1. Okay. So it's not simply enough to know what you did, you need to know what both of you did to find out what your outcomes are. And one of the interesting things that's embedded into this research design um, is that there's sort of two different ways you can think about the outcomes of this game. You can think about what maximizes the most money the two of you can make together. Okay. So if you want to say, look, we're in this study together and we want to maximize how much we jointly get, well, if that's the case, the highest combination you can get here 
is the six dollars that comes from each of you getting three dollars if you both cooperate. So this gets six dollars total paid out, this gets five, this gets five, this gets four. Okay. So if you want to maximize the joint amount of money paid out, you want to both cooperate. But if you want to maximize how much you make personally as player A, you never want to cooperate. You always want to defect. Okay, and here's why. No matter what player B does, you'll be better off financially if you don't cooperate. So let's imagine that player B has decided to cooperate. So I've highlighted these top two cells here. If they cooperate and you cooperate, you get three dollars. If they cooperate and you defect, you get four dollars. Okay. If on the other hand player B defects, if they, if you cooperate, you get one dollar. And if you defect, you get two dollars. So no matter what player B chooses, you do better going over to this column than you do in this column. Okay? So that's just the setup for the game. That's not why I'm telling you about this. Why I'm telling you about this is because of a study that Lee Ross did uh, back in the 1990s. He's a professor at Stanford uh, and in my mind one of the two or three most important people uh, in social psychology over the last 40 years. He's uh, essentially retired now, so if you like his work as much as I do, you can't go work with him in graduate school because he doesn't really take students anymore. But his work is very, very important. So what he did was he took this design and he wanted to test two things against each other. He wanted to test sort of a, a personality account of who would be uh, the cooperators versus the defectors. And then he wanted to pit it against a social psych account of the cooperators versus uh, the defectors. And he did this in the following way. He went to the undergraduate dorms and he went to the dorm advisors, the people who live in the dorms year round uh, with the undergraduates there and who know the undergraduates really well. And he asked the dorm advisors to nominate the kinds of people they think would be cooperators in this game and then to nominate other people who uh, would likely be defectors in this game. Okay, so that's kind of a, a personality type of assessment there, saying I think this is the kind of person who would generally do this versus that. And then he brought in all those people and he had them uh, play the game with one other person. Okay? And the key thing is not who you're playing the game with because you make your own decision without knowing what the other person has done. But Half of the people were told that the name of this game was the Wall Street game. And half of the people were told the name of this game is the community game. Okay? They weren't told anything else differently. So everybody else had the rules explained to them the same way I just explained them to you, sort of showing what the payoffs are for each of your choices, that you have to cooperate or defect, the other pay person will cooperate or defect, you don't get to consult with each other, and here's the financial payoffs for each cell for you and the other person. So everyone got the exact same rules of the game, but half the people were told this is the Wall Street game, and half of the people were told it's the community game. Okay. And so then what he could do is he could pit the personality account against this sort of social labeling, social norm account. And what he found, okay, what's shown here on the y-axis, is the percentage of people in each condition that cooperated, who chose to cooperate rather than defect. And what you can see is that the obvious driving force here is whether people thought they were playing the community game where people were really likely to cooperate or the Wall Street game where less than 50% of people cooperated. They are playing the exact same game with the exact same rules and mechanics. The only thing that differed is this label they were given that changes their understanding of the social norm that's linked to the game. Nothing about the actual game changes, just the social norm associated with it. Should, be, should you be focused on your selfish concerns or should you be focused on the group? Okay, that, and and you, they were never told that that's what the name of the game means. They just counted on people being aware that that's probably um, what those things meant. And what we also see is whether or not you had been nominated as a cooperator or a defector had almost no impact on what you did. 
Okay? So we tend to think people do things because of their personality. And we think we can identify those personalities, and that will predict what they will do in one situation versus another. But what this demonstrates is that what people do depends more on their understanding of what kind of situation they're in and less to do with their personality. Okay? Now, there's no real consequences to this particular uh, little game here. There's a few dollars being exchanged. But there are other cases where similar phenomena have far more profound consequences. So um, this is starting to be a quite dated example, but we're in California. So I'm assuming that even though most of you weren't born at the time, you know that that's Ronald Reagan, and, uh, and he was president uh, for you guys a long time ago. Um, and uh, there was a debate that was held in, in, for the, prior to the 1984 election where he was running against this guy who I'm sure none of you know who that is, unless you're my age. That's Walter Mondale, who didn't win. Um, and at the time that this debate took place, it was about a month before the election, uh, Reagan was a few points ahead, but it was very close. It was neck and neck. There was no um, sort of clear, obvious person who was going to win. They had this debate, and at this time, I think Reagan was the oldest sitting president in the history of the United States. Okay. Um, and, he gave, and people were starting to worry about his ability to serve. And he gave this wonderful debate performance where he was witty and charming. Um, you know, somebody sort of brought up uh, the age issue, and they said, you know, Reagan, do you think that this, is, you know, this age issue is a big issue? And he said, look, you know, if, if my uh, opponent isn't too concerned about his youth and inexperience, I won't bring up the age issue either. And of course, his opponent was 60, but he was like 75. Um, and so he made this joke, he turned it around, and it was sort of a very memorable line, even though I just mangled it. Um, and, and after this debate was over, okay, this debate that took place you know, in front of an audience like this, but much larger. Um, after this debate was over, Reagan took off in the polls and won in the biggest landslide in modern history. So people sometimes pinpoint this particular debate as a major, major contributor to uh, the way in which Reagan won the election in 1984. Now, some social psychologists noticed something interesting about this election. Uh, they thought about the fact that this was done in front of a live audience, and that live audience was very loud and reactive. It's only in the last 10 years or so that audiences for presidential debates have been told that they need to essentially keep silent during the debates, which is kind of weird when, when you sort of hear those debates and you don't hear any reaction. But back then, there used to be lots of reaction, audience reaction. And these social psychologists wondered how much the audience reaction might have been contributing to the perception of the home viewers who all watch this on TV. How much did that audience reaction contribute to the home viewers' perception of how the two candidates had done in the debate? So they ran a study. And in this study, they took the footage of this debate and they showed it to two groups of subjects who had not seen the debate live. So they hadn't seen the debate, they hadn't heard much about the debate, they were living in a cave somewhere. I'm not sure exactly what the deal was with these particular people, uh, but they didn't know much about what had happened. Half of the subjects were shown the debate just like everyone else saw it on live TV. But for the other half, they used some sound engineering to remove the audio related to the audience reactions. Okay? So the audience reactions were all entirely removed. And then they had these two groups of subjects rate uh, what I'll show you is just the performance of Ronald Reagan in this particular debate. And what we can see is that the rating of Ronald Reagan is far higher, far more positive, when uh, the audience reaction was audible to the subjects listening to this compared to when those audience reactions were edited out. Okay? This is a dramatic difference. 45% thought he did a really good job. Right? That's probably not a debate win if you don't hear the people laughing to his jokes, whereas almost 70% thinks he win, wins if they uh, hear the, the laugh track along with it. And so this goes to the idea that we all know that there are laugh tracks on all the 
terrible comedies that we watch and we hate them, we, we see them and we just say, oh, that's, you know, why would they do that? Everybody knows those sound really uh, canned and they sound fake, um, but it turns out that they really work. They really work. We wish they didn't, right? This is a very disturbing thought because what's happening here is people are being affected not by Ronald Reagan and Walter Mondale per se, but by a bunch of strangers in an audience that we'll never meet. And they're determining whether we think Ronald Reagan did well enough in the debate for me to now go vote for him. Okay? Leave aside the idea that how funny the president is should not be an indicator of whether they should be the person with their finger on the button. But leaving that aside, even if that were a good indicator, you're leaving that to a bunch of strangers because they told the same jokes in both of these conditions, but only here did you have complete strangers telling you when you think you should think it's funny. People don't realize that this is happening. They don't realize that they're being affected by the audience reaction. And I'm sure if you asked any of these subjects, you know, what determined your view of, of how the candidates did, they would focus entirely on the things that the candidates said, and they wouldn't focus at all on the fact that well, you know, I heard a lot of laughter after that one joke, and that made me think, I should vote for that guy, right? Nobody would say that, and most of us would be really disturbed if we believed that that's why we changed our vote or our thinking or settled on a candidate because of something like that. But this evidence suggests that there's a real good chance that that's what was actually happening. Okay, so. One of the, so I, I've talked about most of the stuff on this slide already, how humorous you find Reagan should have no effect on whether I want him, uh, you know, deciding our foreign diplomacy, finger on the button, whatever it is that, that matters. Um, it also suggests one of these things that you should know that in any given situation, other people are kind of defining the situation for us. We talked about that last time. We, we're talking about that again here now. But you can use that to your advantage. So, um, so when I was a graduate student, um, you're always trying to find ways to, to get subjects to sign up for studies. We didn't actually have a subject pool where people could sign up for studies for class credit when I started uh, in graduate school. And so we would go places to try to get people to sign up. And one of the places that I would go is I would go to the, the freshman cafeteria. There was this building where all the freshmen on campus would eat. And one of the reasons I would go there is because they had a really slow line that would let people in. So there was this one person who would check everybody's ID to let them in, and there was a really long line, so people ended up waiting for about 10 minutes before they could get inside the cafeteria. So I would go there with a questionnaire, and it would be a questionnaire with maybe 10 or 15 yes-no questions on it. And I would go to the line, and I would actually say out loud, is there anyone here who'd like to be paid $3, okay, and this is, you know, back in 1994, so $3 was a lot more money back then, <laughs> okay. But I would say, does anyone want $3 to fill out this 15, you know, question thing that'll take you less than three minutes and it'll pass the time while you're waiting to get in? And I would say this and people would ignore me like I was a leper, okay. Completely ignore me, not even turn to look at me as I was talking. Right, who's the crazy person talking to us while we're in line? Oh my God, I hope he doesn't come near me. <laughs> and then, at some point, someone would, would say, uh, wait, you'll pay us $3 and fill this out, and you'll, you have cash, you'll give it to us now? Like, I have cash, I'll give it to you now. And they'd be like, all right, I'll, I'll do it. And as soon as one person said, I'll do it, suddenly I had a stampede on my hands of people saying, don't forget me. Don't, don't finish passing those out before you get a chance to give me a questionnaire. Because now it suddenly became the, oh, who wouldn't want $3 to pass the time while on board? That's awesome, right? One person would flip this, right? So circuses, when they used to travel around back in olden times, okay, they would plant people in the audiences to sound excited about whatever it is that the circus was selling. Okay? Because if you get one person to do that, they can define the situation for everyone else because you don't decide for yourself a lot of times. You just go, oh yeah, this is that cool situation. So I should go along with whatever it is they're saying. 
So that's something you can do yourself. You can plant people in audiences to get other people reacting the way you'd like them to. All right, so I want to do um, another little demonstration here. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to um, read the things I put up on the screen. I promise no more profanity, okay, at least not for me. Um, so I'm just going to put stuff up on the screen, and as soon as I do, I want everyone to just read what's up on the screen in unison. We're going to go through a few slides uh, pretty quickly, but just read them all as it comes up, uh, and they're all easy things to read. So here we go. Uh, one, two, three. All right, so for those of you who finished faster on this last one than the other folks, go back and read it again slowly. I love Paris in the, the springtime. Oh. Crap, is that going to be on the exam? Okay. So most people read this as I love Paris in the springtime, right? And that's the natural way to read it. This is one of those cases where the adaptive errors that I talked about last time occurs. When you read, I love Paris in the springtime, except for the one-tenth of one percent of times, like right now where someone's trying to trick you, okay, you're actually going to read what the person meant to type. Right? We have a shared set of understandings of grammar and language and what goes together with what. The context of the meaning of the sentence and the grammar that we all understand as, as English speakers uh, leads our brain to automatically only see the one the. Okay? Because that's the only thing that communicatively makes sense. So it's not that you saw the two thes and said, oh, I'll skip the other one. Right? Usually you just don't see it. And this is the way we are, especially when we proofread our own papers. Uh, we tend to ignore these things where we have like, the same word written twice. Thankfully, Microsoft Word now picks up on the same word written twice, and when it points it out to you, you go, who added that second the? Right? I sure as heck didn't do that, but somebody did. Okay. Um, did anyone notice anything else along the way? Just raise your hand if you noticed something else. Okay, a few people, don't say. A few people noticed something else along the way. So, um, so here we have 12, 13, 14. And here we have A, B, C. Look at that thing in the middle. Ah. It's the same thing. Okay. But virtually no one has any trouble. Who's virtually no one? I just heard someone say, I did. She, OK, so she's now named herself virtually no one, because I just said virtually no one recognizes this. I'm kidding. Um, so ABC, 12, 13, 14, our brain automatically understands what this is supposed to be based on the context. Is it surrounded by letters or numbers? I have never heard someone say A13C. <laughs> I've done this for thousands of people, never once A13C. Okay. Always ABC, 12, 13, 14, and almost no one notices even though I leave it in the exact same spot on the screen. Right? Same spot usually goes right by. And this means our brain is automatically making sense of the context. And in all likelihood, when someone makes up this font, they're doing it because they want you to read this as a B. Right? You're following their intent. But in actuality, it's ambiguous. Right? This is the B13 ambiguous thing. Objectively, it's neither. You can't objectively say it's one or the other, but your brain has no problem making that decision automatically, construing what that thing is, interpreting it automatically. So we don't see this ambiguous thing and say, well, with the A and the C around it, it's a good bet to say it's a B. At some level, your brain is doing that, but consciously, you're not. Consciously, you just see ABC. 12, 13, 14. Okay. So this goes back to what I talked about last time. We don't see snakes and then decide they're dangerous after the fact. The seeing involves 
these non-conscious inferences that happen at the moment of perception. Okay. Let's do one more of these. Um, I think this next one, I want everyone to read to themselves. Uh, just because last time I did this out loud, it just sounded awful. So um, to sort of save everyone's ears, just read this uh, out loud and raise your hands. Well, I'll tell you when to stop. Go ahead and read. To yourselves. Okay, so you can stop. So just about everyone, right, can read this almost as easily as they can read this. Right? It doesn't feel that much different once you actually start looking at it as opposed to sort of looking at it as a whole and going, that looks like a jumble. As soon as you engage it, it's easy to read. And they're right. As long as you've got the first and last letter and the rest of the letters are in there somewhere, we can read those things. And so, in a sense, this is what you were actually seeing as you were reading that previous paragraph. Okay? This one, I think, is just a powerful demonstration because if I showed you this without sort of letting you start reading it, and I just said, do you think you'd be able to read this in the abstract without you already knowing that you could? I think most people would say, how could anyone read something where all the letters are jumbled up? Okay. But our brain is exquisitely attuned to figuring out these things, to sorting through these kinds of issues so that we can get what we really are supposed to get, even if it's technically a mistake. I mean, this doesn't actually say according to research at Cambridge University. It's an error to think that's what this says. Because that's not what's actually up there. But that's what you all saw. That's what you all read. It's the only thing you understood. Nobody said, ah, according to rush ik at kmad, right? Nobody did that in their head and then said, let me see if I can rearrange those things and make the anagram work or something like that. Nobody does that. It's automatic. Your brain does it. It interprets things. It construes things the way it should. Okay, so. We've already talked through this, but there's this idea that these errors, and they are errors, you're not seeing reality as it is. You're describing it as something that's not actually there, but they're very adaptive. They're useful. They get us to the place that the communicator wants us to get to, and so they serve a very useful purpose. So it's adaptive to make these particular kinds of mistakes. And that's a hard notion, I think, for a lot of people to appreciate, is that errors can be useful but they can. That's a good question. How proficient do you have to be in a language to read it correctly when the letters are all jumbled? No idea. No idea. Um, but I mean, I think, there, I, I think it's an interesting question because I think there could be interesting dynamics there because when we start out with another language, we are consciously translating everything in our head um, and so, you know, it's interesting what is happening at the moment when you switch over. Is that the same moment where you actually start to subjectively feel proficient in that other language? Are those things connected? I think that's, that's an interesting question. So, I want to turn now to what's generally agreed upon to be the most important study in the history of social psychology. Um, Milgram's obedience to authority. Um, and you've all heard about this in Psych 10. How many of you saw the Milgram movie? Do they still show it? Smaller and smaller numbers show it. When I started teaching this 10 years ago, 95% of the people in here had seen the movie, um, and now very few people. Um, but most of you are probably familiar with the idea behind Milgram's study, but we're going to talk about it in a different way here. We're going to talk about it from a situational construal, construal perspective. But first, I just want to describe kind of the basic components of the study, how it went, so I can make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what was actually done. So in the Milgram study, two subjects would come in to be part of a learning experiment. Okay? Now in actuality, one of the subjects was really a confederate. And a confederate means um, that this is someone who's actually working with and for the experimenter, pretending to be someone in the study who they aren't really. It's just one of the many ways that social psychologists lie to their subjects. Um, so two people come in, both saying that they're here for this learning experiment, but one of them is really in on the experiment as a confederate. 
and uh, they're told that they're looking at the role of uh, shock as a reinforcer for learning processes. And so one of them is going to be in the role of a learner, and one of them is going to be in the role of a teacher. And the learner uh, is going to get shocked when he makes mistakes on what he's learning to help uh, use sort of punishment reinforcement to improve his learning. And both of the people agree to be in the experiment, and they both agree that they could end up in either role, okay? but it's rigged. They pick names out of a hat to decide who's going to be the learner and who's going to be the teacher. But the confederate always lies and says he picked up the piece of paper that said he's going to be the learner. Actually, both pieces of paper say teacher on it. Okay? But the learner says, oh, I got the, the, the learner piece of paper, but he never shows it to the other person. And they say, okay, fine, you're the learner, and you, the real subject, they don't say that, you, the real subject, you're the teacher. Now, uh, there's going to be shock involved, and the learner is going to be getting these shocks, but we want the teacher to be able to um, appreciate what the shock feels like. So they take the teacher, and they have the teacher go into the room where the shock device is, and they put their arm down, and they shock the person with you know, a mild to moderate shock, not a very intense shock at all. Um, I think it's maybe 30 or 45 volts. You know, not something you'd pay to have done to you, but not something that's so bad either. Um, I should say not something most people would pay to have done to them. Um, <laughs> there, there are all kinds of people. So, um, so the, the learner, the, sorry, the teacher now knows that this shock machine really delivers shock, and they felt the shock, and they know it's not the nicest thing in the world to feel. And so now the, the learner gets strapped in, literally, strapped in so their arm can't move. And this is just to keep the device working properly, theoretically. Okay? And so the learner is strapped in over here. And they're now in a separate room from the teacher, who's the real subject, and the experimenter who's sitting here. Okay? And the way it's set up is um, there's a... There's a learning task where you have to learn words that are associated together. It's a really boring, annoying task. And every time the, uh, the learner gets it wrong, they get a shock. Okay? And they get a shock. The teacher has to deliver the shock by flicking one of these switches. Each of these switches delivers a different strength shock. So it goes from 15 volts all the way up to 450 volts. And each time the subject, the, the learner, gets one wrong, the teacher, who's the real subject, has to go to the next voltage, which is up in 15 volt increments. They have to go up 15 volts to the next switch and deliver a shock. They have to say something like, that's incorrect, and then they give the shock. Okay? And to make sure that the learner appreciates the different levels, right? there's also these subjective descriptions given, slight shock, moderate shock, uh, intense shock, extreme shock, danger, severe shock, and then XXX, pornography, OK? Um, which, if you think about it, may explain why the results turned out some of the ways that they did. Um, so uh, so th this starts, and the subject, uh, the, sorry, the learner gets a few of the answers right, and then they get one wrong, and they get 15 volts, OK? And then they, they move up every time they get one wrong. Um, and what the experimenter is interested in is the point at which the subject who's controlling the shock machine will sort of say, I'm no longer going to deliver these shocks to the other person. I stop. You know, I, I, I want to be out of this experiment. I won't do it. Okay? When will they stop obeying? And uh, to help this along, the learner who's in the other room, who isn't actually getting shocked at all, the learner goes into the other room and plays uh, a set of preset audio responses to the different shock levels to help incentivize the teacher to stop. So um, at 75 volts, which I guess is about the fifth error that they make, they get up to 75 volts. For the first time, the, uh, the learner gives a little grunt. Okay? And then um, at the next couple levels, they start giving more painful groans. Uh, and then at 150 volts, the victim learner cries out, experimenter, get me out of here. I won't be in the experiment anymore. I refuse to go on. Okay? So the person in the other room who's just a poor subject, just like you, 
now yells, I won't go on, get me out of here. Okay. Um, at 180 volts, they, they yell out, I can't stand the pain. Okay. At 270 volts, there's an agonizing scream that goes on for several seconds. After 300 volts, you never hear the learner again. <laughs> the learner gives no more responses to the questions and no more responses to the painful stimulation. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different varieties of this study, yes. And in one of them they say, uh, and in, it's in the movie, they say, I have a heart problem. I told you before we started, I have a heart condition and I feel my heart starting to hurt. And then you don't hear this person ever again after 300 volts, right? So what have you got to be thinking at this point if you're the person doing the shocking, right? You're up here at something that says danger severe and you've got someone who's non-responsive in the other room. Okay. So what did these folks do? Well, most of you already know what they did. Um, the vast majority of the subjects went all the way to XXX. Okay, 68% of the subjects went to XXX. Okay. And you can also see there's a few people who only went to what's intense. Intense is 255 volts. So this is 255, this is probably 300 something, this is probably about 400, and this is 450. Okay. So this is where all of the different subjects that were in this classic important study stopped. So here's the key question. Okay. What do all of you think of these people? What do you think of them? Do you want them to be your friend, your neighbor, the person you need in a time of crisis? No, you don't want them to be that. Um, Here's the thing, okay? So, if we think about the three sections of the classroom, you guys are the 68%. Okay? You're them. You're the 68%. And you guys who are all feeling pretty good about yourself now because you're not the 68%, well, you still did this. <laughs> that's not so nice. Okay? But that's not how we think about these folks. We look at these folks and we say, this person is evil. Something is really wrong with this person. They're either evil or they're weak. There's something really wrong with them. Why do we say that? So let me ask all of you. How many of you would stop when the person says, I won't do this anymore. Get me out of here. That's at 150 volts. How many of you would stop delivering shock to someone when they say, I won't be a part of this anymore? Okay, I would, right? Who wouldn't stop then? <laughs> like, I don't care about shocking that person. I get no joy out of that, and they're saying I want out. I'm not going to keep going, okay? Except, while that's our theory of what we would do, we're wrong, okay? This is what we actually do. This is a way pre better predictor of what you would actually do than what you each think you would do. But what we do is we use what we think we would do as our standard for evaluating these folks. Right? It's just like the example where you're driving on the road that I used last time. The people who would go further than you are the people who are crazy or weak or something else mentally disturbed in some way or another. And so if I believe that I would have stopped down here when the person first complained, then all these people are terrible. Okay? So this comparison that we do is what I refer to as the reasonable person standard. It gets used in the legal context as well. But you know, who do we know that's more reasonable than ourselves? So it's not the reasonable person standard, it's the what would I do standard. Right? I am the reasonable person. We all think we have all the common sense in the world. So if I was going to do X, that's the reasonable thing to do. Okay? So anyone who does what I think I would do is just doing what's expected. And anyone who goes further right, is crazy, mean, stupid, or biased. 
the rule of crazy, mean, stupid, or biased. Anyone who does worse than what I think I would do is crazy, mean, stupid, biased, or in this case, weak. We can add to it. And the problem here is that we have an inaccurate estimate of what we ourselves would do. And so we're using a very poor point of comparison for judging those folks who actually went through the study. Now, to be fair to, to all of you and everyone else who's ever sort of heard of this before, um, Milgram actually went and did his homework before he ran this study. After he ran the study, there were so many ethical complaints raised about the damage that he might be doing to the people who were providing the shocks. Um, incidentally, that's actually you know, just not true. The vast majority of the people who delivered the shock said, actually, I learned something profoundly important about myself in doing this. Um, and they still said that years later when they were followed up with. Um, but Milgram did his homework ahead of time, and he went to a sample of, I believe, 60 psychiatrists. And he said, is there any risk to um, the people who are going to be the, the teachers, the actual subjects in this study? Um, and they said, the, the psychiatrist, I think all but one of them said, there's no risk at all because none of them are going to agree to shock as soon as the, the learner says, I want to stop, everyone's going to stop. So all the psychiatrists said, yeah, there's no danger because your experiment's going to end in five minutes. Right? The psychiatrists had no idea that most people would go to 450 volts. And by the way, they kept doing 450 volts until the experimenter told them to stop. So it wasn't like they got to 450 and then said, eh, now I'm done. Okay? No, they just kept going and then eventually the experimenter would say, all right, that's enough. Uh, we, can, we can tell you what's going on here. Um, so we don't realize, and neither did psychiatrists, that most of us would be in that highest category. And the really disturbing thing is most of you still don't realize that. Right? How many of you still think you would be better than any of these outcomes? How many of you think you'd be somewhere over here below 250 volts? I do. Right? We keep thinking that. So the problem is, is that knowing that this is a better indicator of what we would likely do okay, than what we believe about our future selves. Okay, this is one of those cases where we do not know what we do not know. And we were very resistant to finding out what's actually true. We're very wed to our theories, even though they're completely inaccurate. Now, one of the reasons we're wed to our theory is because we think we really understand what it would be like to be in that situation. But there's at least two major situational factors affecting the person in that situation that are hard for us as outsiders to fully appreciate. Can anyone tell me um, what those two factors are? One is a really sort of obvious one. And they're motivating them how? What's the mechanism? said it's important, but, you know, I wouldn't shoot someone just because they told me it was important. Right, you have to continue, but, but most of us don't think that that would motivate us to leave someone in a room, potentially passed out unconscious, continuing to get shocked, right? Yeah, they get paid, but not very much. Not enough to, you know, kill someone. You got to get paid more than that. In the back? Somebody else is what? Yeah, someone who has authority. Okay, so right the I, I put it right there. Milgram's obedience to authority study. That's what it's called. You can read the book. Obedience to authority. Um, that's the simple explanation. That now, after we've you know seen his studies for fifty years, we know that's a major factor that's at play there. But clearly, the psychiatrists didn't know that going into it. They didn't appreciate the way in which authority could influence people to do this. They're in separate rooms, and it does matter how close the teacher and learner are to each other. Okay? And that's not something that we would think in the abstract would be driving this. We wouldn't say, oh, well, if I'm in the same room, I'm not willing to kill him. But if he's four feet away and there's a wall between us, I'm OK killing him. Because right? you might have killed this person. You don't know. It has to be a reasonable possibility you're seeing danger, severe shock. The person has screamed, and now they're non-responsive. You know, it's not like, oh, they're just playing a game on me. You know, that's like, that's scary business. And this is before anyone knew that social psychologists deceived people, so. Also, 
Right, so this is one of the ways that we use authority is we say, well, I'm not responsible, they are. Okay? Um, but, you know, if you've ever watched any crime shows on TV, you pull the trigger, you're responsible. There might be someone else responsible too, but you're going up the river if you kill someone, even if someone paid you, as if even if makes it like a good thing. Um, well, they were the ones who really wanted it, not me. Okay? That doesn't work. And we know that you know, people who are soldiers can be held accountable when they engage in behavior simply due to obedience when you know, the behaviors are considered you know, war crimes and, and things like that. Sure, they said he's not answering, and if he doesn't answer, he has to be shocked. He got it wrong. Okay? Now, there's another factor besides all the things related to obedience that are driving this response. Okay? And this one is the one you probably didn't hear about when you learned about this before, because everyone learns about the obedience to authority account. But there's something else that I think is actually perhaps more insidious and makes it even harder for us to appreciate the perspective of the person in the study. Any guesses? Totally non-authority related things. Yeah, in the back. All right, in the back and louder. Wanting to do things the right way, I don't think so, because I think most people would think the right thing to do here would be to not kill someone. But I mean, I can see at lower levels of shock that that might be something that would be relevant, is that you want to sort of be competent in doing the right thing. So, yeah. Oh, so it could have been me getting killed. So it's okay. So I should kill. Okay. That, that, that's a possibility. I could see that crossing somebody's mind. Um, yeah. It's in the interest of science. It's in the interest of science. Yeah, but come on. How much do these people actually care about the interest of science? Like a little. Like that does matter, but not enough to kill someone. Right? Yes. Ah, uh, see, someone said that. Someone else has equal opportunity to be in the same position. All right, I'm going to tell you, because no one ever guesses this one. This one is the really hard one to guess, and that's what makes it so insidious, right? Invisible situations have more power because we don't know that they're playing out, and so we can't take them into account. So here's the thing. Nobody starts out at 450 volts. You start out at 15. And that very first time when you start out at 15 volts, he, the, the learner gets another one wrong, and you say, uh, the experimenter says, okay, now you've got to go up to the next level. And so you say, okay, well, you know, 15 volts, that's actually a pretty small shock. 30, just 15 volts higher, that's not so bad. Okay. Now you've gone up to 30, and now they say, okay, next time you get one wrong, you've got to go up another 15 volts. Well, going up 15 volts, that's no bad, so bad. There's never a time at which going up 15 volts is what crosses the line between your behavior being ethical and unethical. And the tricky thing is, is that somewhere along the line here, you've crossed the line. I don't know that we could come to an assessment of where that line really, really is. Maybe that line is, I won't be in this study at all to begin with. I'm not sure. But the key thing is, once you start progressing, as you're a subject in this study, you're not thinking, is it OK to give someone 255 volts of uh, shock? What you're thinking is, I just gave someone 240 volts of shock. Is it OK to add 15 volts? Well, it's always OK to add 15 volts. 15 volts isn't the big deal. Now, here's the thing. If you want to say 255 volts isn't OK, was 240 okay? Because you just gave 240. Okay. So in order to stop, you have to decide not just that the next thing that you would have to do is ethically inappropriate, but that what you've already been doing is ethically inappropriate. And it sneaks up on you. Okay. Because you're thinking about that 15 volts, and going up by 15 volt increments isn't that much. And so you find yourself on what's called um, slippery slope. Okay, a slippery slope is where you ever so slowly get yourself kind of committed to doing things a certain way, 
And now to untangle yourself means looking back on what you've already agreed to do and saying that was inappropriate. And remember hypothesis five, right? We're motivated to be consistent. We are motivated to be consistent with ourselves and with what we believe in. And we don't believe in hurting people. Okay? And so for me to be consistent, I've got to say that whatever I choose for 255, now that I've already done 240, is consistent with what I did for 240. Okay? If it's okay to do 240, it's got to be okay to do 255. And if I now decide I won't do 255, that means it wasn't okay for me to do 240 or 225 or probably a number of things that I've already done that caused someone else great pain. So we're motivated to not see those past events as bad behavior. And that gets in the way of seeing the next event as being bad behavior. Okay? That's subtle. If I took any of you in and just said, hey, I want you to give 450 volts of shock, no one would do it. And they've run those studies. So when you just start with the high level right off the bat, that's easy. Everyone says, no way would I give that kind of shock to someone. But if you sneak up on someone, and you actually are really having the person sneak up on themselves in a sense, right? they're slowly committing themselves to more and more sort of devious acts, there's no point at which they go, there's the line and I won't cross it. Because they have to, at that point, say, you know what? I already crossed it. Um, so, so this is a powerful thing that no one ever sees. And so when we look at them, we say, well, I would never shock over 150 volts. And maybe if we just brought you in and said, here, give someone 150 volts of shock, that's true. But it's not true if I had you start at 1 volt, and then go to 2 volts, and then 3 volts. And it's very hard for us to figure that out on our own. So we end up thinking that we would do something very different than what those folks in the actual study did. So we misunderstand the experience of those individuals. Okay, so. Why do we misjudge others? Because we have the wrong model of experience and perception. We don't understand how our own experience and perception works. We tend to think that we're camcorders, video recorders, that accurately record whatever reality is, and it's just reality's out there, it gets imprinted on my video camera, that's me, that's my mind, and I just sort of simply have the facts after that. So there's events out in the world, they're visible to us, and as a function of that, we simply know reality directly, um, and this lets us sort of generate accurate uh, assessments of other people's thoughts, behaviors, uh, morality, their personality, and so on. Now, in reality, I think what social psychologists uh, and also Buddhists about 2,000 years ago figured out um, is that the way we see the world is entirely constructive. We're not like camcorders at all. It's a constructive process where on the front end, there's events of interest, just like here, and then there's other things that are invisible to us. Okay, there's other things that we can't detect about the situation. We may not be able to see the authority that's influencing that person, so that can be invisible to us. Okay? And then there's this intermediary process of subjective construal where stuff comes in and we interpret it. We make sense of it based on our set of expectations and beliefs. So that B slash 13 thing becomes a B if we're in the letter expectation situation, and it becomes a 13 automatically if we're in the number expectation situation. Okay? That's a construal process, and I'll come back to that, where we construct reality, but we mistake that constructed reality for simply knowing and reading off reality from the world around us. Okay. So I want to spend a little time um, on the definitions of some of these terms here. Sorry, just looking at some stuff on my slides. So um, these are sort of the three key terms. These are the two terms that make up the, the title of the lecture today. And I'm guessing most of you still don't know exactly what those mean, especially naive realism. Situations we've talked about. They include the immediate actual physical and social environment around you, but also the implied or believed 
physical and social environment around you. So what you believe is going on around you is just as important or more important than what's actually going on around you. And your own thoughts, habits, and prior situations can act as a context that determines how you're going to interpret what's going on in that situation. Okay, so there's stuff inside your head that determines things in a situational kind of way. Okay, so I can ask you in the abstract, how does a free trip to Palm Springs sound? Pretty good, I guess. Turns out that if before you do this, you have people spending a moment thinking about what it's like to live in Alabama, then they think a trip to Palm Springs is great. And if you have them spend a minute before they're doing this thinking about what it's like to live in Hawaii, Palm Springs, eh, not so great. Okay? Their interpretation of what it would be like to win this free trip can be dramatically affected by what you sort of temporarily get activated in someone's head, those expectations. Are we in the letter or number situation with that B13 thing? Those two, two different things I, I, I talked about having people imagine, they affect that same kind of thing. Subjective construal. Construal, construe, simply means to interpret. So subjective construal refers to the way that each of us, as individuals, interprets what we see around us in the world. And critically, subjective construal is often automatic. Okay? It uses the situational inputs that are around us and the existing habits of our mind okay, to make sense of what it is that we see. And we experience this as seeing reality even though we're actually interpreting and construing. We don't realize that we're interpreting and construing. Okay. Um, so we never just see reality for what it is and then uh, interpret it afterwards. I shouldn't say that. We, we do that too. Um, but you can actually go down to the lowest level of the visual cortex, the thing that just relates to you know, whether you're seeing lines this way or this way, and it doesn't respond to anything else. And if you give someone expectations about what they're going to be seeing, you can affect activity in that lowest level as it responds to those lines. So you can bias these low, low sensory processes in the brain. Okay, so even those aren't immune to our beliefs and expectations, the situational factors that are influencing us. All right, I've said this enough times today, so I'm not going to say that again. So um, let's look at these next slides, uh, uh, see what's up here real quickly. Okay, so what was up there? Right, there's a moving dot across the screen. We experience it as a moving dot, right? But of course, it's just three separate PowerPoint slides. And the dot on the first PowerPoint slide bears no relationship in reality to the dot on the second slide or the dot on the third, right? They're unlinked. They have no relationship to one another. But they feel like it's the same dot to you because your brain tells you that's a dot moving across the screen. Okay? This is the same way that all motion pictures that we see work, right? There's no movement in the movies that we see. There's a series of still frame pictures that get played by rapidly and our brain interprets that as motion. There is no actual motion in those. Okay, it's something that we perceive. Now, I want to turn off the lights for this next one. Let's see. Um, yes, we're talking about construal, we're talking about interpretation. Um, okay. So what I want everyone to do for this next one is um, I just want you to stare at this dot right here. Keep staring. Don't look away. Keep looking. Keep looking. So, 
Everyone saw the color picture show up that turned to black and white, right? Or most people did. Raise your hand if you saw that. A color picture turned to black and white. Okay, there is no color picture, right? It's just a reverse image thing that's done so perfectly that you then see a full color image for a couple of seconds. I know. Okay. Right, this is very powerful and persuasive, I think, because you actually saw a color picture. Right, there's no difference between seeing a color picture and having it set up by your brain to do that than seeing an actual color picture. Your brain doesn't know the difference between those two. So it doesn't know that in one case, the past situation that you were just in makes you think it's a color picture, and now, in the other case, it's because someone actually shows you a color picture. Your brain doesn't know the difference between those two, so it's difficult to take into account, but with situations like this, we can show how your brain is actually working. Okay. Um, so, as far as we're concerned, it really was a color photo. It just wasn't physically up here out in the world, but as far as our mind and brain was concerned, it was. Oh, sure, if we had made the colors look totally artificial, it would make you think, I wonder who photoshopped that picture, or whatever it is. No, 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 you put it there because these are the reverse of all the colors that you ended up seeing here. So they, they basically are um, tiring out particular uh, visual receptors, and when those tire out, they then tend to see the opposite when you're shown black and white. Okay, so, okay. naive realism. Okay. We've gone through these top things already. Experience is constructed through a process that we call subjective construal. We often aren't aware that it's happening, so we don't realize our own contributions to our experience or the effects, invisible effects of situations on our experience. We don't realize any of those things, and therefore, experience seems real and objective. I'm just getting reality for what it is. Naive realism is a disbelief in or a lack of appreciation for subjective construal and the fact that uh, subjective construal can lead to multiple reasonable perspectives. Okay? It's, it's a disbelief in the fact that you and I could see the exact same thing differently and it's not because you're crazy, mean, or stupid, or biased, or weak. Okay? It's thinking, I'm a camcorder, you're a camcorder, if we target our camcorder on the same event, we're going to get the same reality, because that's how it works. So naive realism means you believe in the camcorder model of seeing the world, and naive realism means you don't believe in the constructive model of seeing the world. Now, I have to give a caveat to this. I'm guessing a lot of you now believe in something like the constructive model of seeing the world. But you believe it reflectively. You believe it as something you sort of technically know, but you're going to walk out of here and walk around just as if you don't believe it. Right? So it's one of these abstract ideas, but it's not something embedded in your immediate way of seeing the world. So when I say lack of appreciation for, in our ongoing moment-to-moment -moment experience, we tend to all become naive realists, even if in the abstract we know, well, really it's all constructed and you could have a different perspective. It doesn't matter. When my wife disagrees with me and I've seen reality and she sees a different reality, it doesn't matter that I've taught this lecture 15 times, right? She's crazy and I'm right. Okay, it usually turns out that she's right and I'm crazy. Um, but that takes me a couple days to figure out. Um, so, even if we believe in this model, we don't believe it all the way down in our system. It's very hard to get that deep into the system. What are the consequences of this? Okay, the consequences okay, is that we can't imagine other people having different experiences given the same inputs. As I said, two camcorders on the same event record the same reality, and when they don't, their camcorder must be broken. And in psychological terms, broken means crazy means stupid, biased, weak, those sorts of things. 
not, oh, they might have a really great perspective. Maybe I should think about what they're saying as an interesting input and an alternative way to think about what I saw. No, we don't do that. That's not what we do because we don't think that it's something we kind of thought about and came to a conclusion about. We think we saw reality. And there's only one reality, and if I saw it, you either saw it or you didn't. Um, so we're going to spend the next couple minutes getting ready to end, but before we do it, we're going to do a demonstration. Okay? Um, I have to look at my slides here to make sure. Okay. So this is called the tapping demonstration. Okay, this taxes my musical abilities every year. Um, so I'm going to divide the classroom into halves. And I'm going to blind myself in the process. Okay, so you're group one. You're group A. Okay, group A, group one, group B. Group A, group B. If you're right down the middle here, pick your side and stick with it. Okay, you get free will here. You get to choose your side. So pick a side down the middle, stick with it. So I want um, everyone in group A to close your eyes, but don't go to sleep. Just close your eyes. Okay, everyone, group A, closed eyes. Keep them closed. Okay, everyone in group B, you all saw what was on the screen? Okay. Um, okay, you can open your eyes. Okay, now if you had your eyes open, close them. Group A, keep your eyes open. Okay, so everybody on this side saw what was on the screen? Yeah, okay, so everyone eyes open. Here we go. Better or for worse? Okay. Okay, so um, raise your hand if you knew what song I was tapping. If you knew what song I was tapping, raise your hand. Unless you don't have arms, I should be seeing some arms raised over here. I can see you, okay? And on this side, group A, raise your hands if uh, you know what the song was. See, one, two, three. Okay, group B, raise your hands if you knew what the song was. Okay, so there's a big difference here between group A and group B. Um, so group A, you were the first hand I saw raised. What song was it? Star Spangled Banner. Come on, people, how did you not know that? Really? No? Just the three of you got that? Um, okay. You weren't supposed to get it. So let me show you what I showed to the two sides. So group B saw this when you all had your eyes closed. Okay. And when group B had their eyes closed, group A saw this. Okay. Now, the kind of interesting question that you can ask now of the kind of people who are in group B, and it doesn't work when you have both types of people in the same room, it changes the dynamics, but experimentally we can ask, what do group B, group B people think they would have done had they been in group A? Okay. And it turns out, um, this was a dissertation that was done at Stanford, People that were in the group A situ group B situation thought that 50% of the people in group A would know it was the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, people in this situation think, I would have known it if I was in that situation, 
when in fact only about 2% of people, so you guys are right in the norm, know what it is. Okay. So this sets up a situation which we might refer to as the curse of knowledge, where you experience things fundamentally differently and it becomes very difficult for you to appreciate or empathize with the experience of these folks. And here's the important subjective construal. When you think about what you would have heard had you been in that group, right, you're thinking about what you heard when I was tapping. And when I was tapping, most of you probably actually heard the Star Spangled Banner in your head. You didn't just hear me tapping, you heard a symphony playing. Maybe you heard someone singing at a ball game. Right? Whereas these poor folks over here just heard my horrible tapping. <laughs> and you think, well, I would have heard the symphony just like I just did if I heard that tapping. Okay? So the key thing that we want to take away from this is that when we think about all these situational influences, it's like we always have this symphony playing in our head. And we can't appreciate the fact that other people have a different symphony. We have that symphony and we say, well, anyone else would hear that too. But that symphony is something that you all added to my very poor tapping that they weren't able to add because they didn't have the right situational inputs. Okay, we have a little more on this lecture that we'll do next time. Uh, I will see you on Tuesday. Have a great weekend.